What flavour today? Vanilla. Oh. Always the same. Always the same. How is it? How is that? Not yeah. I thought you always had like red hazel berry or something. Ah. Just vanilla, mate. Fair. Which in itself is vanilla. Just having the same flavour. Yeah. yeah. So you do the math. Welcome to Drum and Drummer, a podcast focused on drums, drumming and drummers. I'm George Pickering and that's Ben Winty and we are both professional drummers in this business we call music. So stick around and join us as we pass the time whilst trying to stay in time. I might be here, I might not. Yeah. I don't live here. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Try your luck. Welcome to Drum and Drummer. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Welcome. Yeah, you? Good, yeah. Yeah. Busy little boy, actually. Yeah, you have yeah. been. You Studio. you didn't reply to any of my funny texts over the weekend, and I was like, <laughs> "Oh, is he is he dead? <laughs> Were they funny? Well, oh, for no. fuck's sake! <laughs> is that minute. the door? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'll keep things moving. He doesn't know that I'm going to keep talking. But hello, listeners, it's just me. Ben might edit this out. He might not. Let's see what he does. Uh, today we have a guest on the show, Matt Billups. He is a theatre drummer, a um, friend of Ben's. They met in Ikea the other week and he invited him on the show. And uh, this is our chat with him. However, Ben doesn't know that I've just said all this because he has literally left the room in which he's recording from. And he's back. I'm going to pretend I didn't say any of that. And here he is. You all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did I did an intro while you went to the door. Oh, yeah? You, you can listen to that back. It was quite good, actually. <laughs> okay. I'll leave it to the edit. Yeah, is that, well, that's what yeah. I said, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, just studios, very busy. Very Yeah, you had a busy weekend. Busy weekend, yeah. So sorry for being slow on the text. No, it's all right. I don't mind. But it's, uh, I was just like, Christ, what's going on? Is he, you know, is he <laughs> ill? But that, but that in itself is a bad assumption to make. Why aren't you on your phone all the time? You know, yeah, shouldn't shouldn't have to expect that. But uh, yeah, well, lockdown gave us that false pretense of you yeah. got no excuse now. Yeah, for not replying. No, because I know you're not doing anything. Exactly, and yeah. I was aware that you knew I wasn't doing anything. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. But um, here we are. Are you good? <laughs> yeah, I got a bit of a cold, but it's all right. Ah. Nothing I can't handle. Um, should we say who the guest is today? Yeah. We've got uh, Mr. Matt Billups. Matthew Billups. Big up the Billups. Sure. Yeah. Do you like that? I thought of that earlier. I thought I'd say that. Yeah. You're buzzing. He's been absolutely <laughs> buzzing. I can see on the call, on the Zoom, he's the little grin. He's just thinking The whole something. time he's like, I've got something here. <laughs> I'm going to drop this. What is it again? Big up the Billups. Big up the Billups. Yeah. I like it. I preferred it the second time. Did you? What? Because yeah. you sort of heard it more. I think, yeah. Yeah. I appreciated the uh, alliteration. Yeah. A bit more. Because um, I think Matt, it's alliteration oh. and a, sorry, <laughs> and it's that it's that other thing where it's the same amount of syllables as well. Mm -hmm. Big up and billop, you know, or if it billops. Yeah. And you've got up in both, but it's like you've replaced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many reasons it's great. Yeah. Exactly. But let's move on. <laughs> move on. Uh, Matt is uh, a drummer. Yep. There we go. Now, Matt's filled in for my bands years ago, Decade mm -hmm. of Victoriana. And so uh, I've never really met the guy. No. Maybe, I think, once outside when we were loading for a gig. The rare occasion we did actually meet. Yeah. Bumped into him the other day. Yep. Matt, do you want to come on the podcast? Yep. He was hesitant. Then he said yes. He was, yeah. Very modest man. Very which we'll modest find man. out in the interview. Um, uh, a very lovely chat, and he's had a very successful, very interesting career thus far. Yeah, and continues to do so. In the, uh, mainly in the world of theatre. Mm. And we've not really had anyone from the theatre world no. before, so we picked his brains. Yeah. Because loads of stuff we don't know about it. Yeah, loads. And, and it's really interesting. Stuff that blew our minds, you know, yeah. so when you're in that pit. Well, I mean, choose which one you want, because I sort of did an intro when you were out the room. So uh... <laughs> it should be like a choose your own adventure podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you want to do the intro? Choose your fighter, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's crack on, isn't it? Yep. Here we go. Big up the Billups. 
So Matt Billups, welcome to Drum and Drummer. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's all right. We bumped into each other a few weeks ago. We did. In the IKEA restaurant. And you were getting your dinner. Yeah. Because you were playing at the Mayflower. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Bumped into it. Bumped into each other over uh, some meatballs. It was some lovely. Meatballs. <laughs> yeah. So that leads on to you're currently on tour. Yeah, so I'm currently <laughs> working on a I show. I was going to lead on to meatballs. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could talk all day, all day about IKEA meatballs. Um, yeah, currently on a show called The Share Show, which is a, a, a musical based on the life and music of Share, which uh, is actually a lot of fun. I've had a really good time doing it. Um, you don't realise actually how many massive hits Cher has had and her whole um, era with Sonny and Cher. And um, it's, yeah, it's a really, really satisfying show to play. Loads of great music, lots of different um, genres within that. And yeah, I've had a great time. We've been on the road for the best part of a year now. So wow. it's, uh, we've, done, we've done it a few times, but uh, it's, it's still really, really good fun. So let's go into that then. So you're, this show is touring... Uh, UK or is it going any further? Just the UK at the moment, yeah. With um, weekly touring mostly, so we just basically do a um, we do about eight shows uh, within five days um, in each city, and then we have a couple of days off to move to the next place, and then we, uh, we do it all over again. So, what's that kind of? I guess like what's that like really? That that being, you know, you're there for a week, you play. Do you then go home in between the weeks, or do you just travel on? Or I mean, I think in theory, um, we are supposed to kind of travel on, uh, but I know I try to, and most of the band do, uh, try and get home for at least kind of 24 hours. Um, it's something that you get better at. The more tours you do, uh, um, you kind of, each time you do it, you get slightly better at touring. Um, and I, there was definitely times in the past where I used to just kind of go venue to venue at certain points, and it sort of takes its toll. I've realized, I think this is probably a, a post-lockdown thing of, of actually how important it is just to kind of let your feet touch the ground for a, for even just for a day and do some normal life things um otherwise you just kind of end up living on the job and uh, and it kind of yeah slowly you don't really realize at the time that you're um you kind of lose your sense of kind of normal life a little bit so it's yeah i really try and prioritize now i've got, I've got a partner robin and uh, i try and come back and, and see her at least once a week bless her and um and yeah, just do normal life stuff, which is nice. And um, what, just a drum kit thing straight away, like, does your kit get taken around for you to the venues? Yeah, so um, they, yeah, they transport all the stuff, all the, all of the band here um, with basically all the, the set and scenery. Um, that's quite handy. So they, they provide, on this show, they provide massive kind of wardrobe trundles, essentially just a big box on wheels. Um, so I, hard case all my gear but then put that within a, a larger trundle um so yeah on a saturday night we just do the two shows and then we we pack down and and thankfully we can just kind of leave the gear there packed in its trundle and um we arrive in the next city on the tuesday and um it, it's all there waiting for us so we have to obviously set it up ourselves but um it kind of beats uh, having done years and years of one-nighters uh it's it's quite nice just to set up at the start of the week and pack down at the end of the week Mm, yeah definitely should we talk about what your kit setup is for the tour then yeah of course that. um so i'm using a, a gretsch renowned which is uh, it's a it's a kit that i bought from a friend years ago actually for um i kind of wanted a second b kit just for things like weddings and um just a, a kind of kit that i was really happy with um uh and i've got this yeah lovely gretsch renowned which i think is just kind of a mid-level um kit but it sounds amazing and uh what i love about it is it's it's kind of really hard wearing it's got a a wrap on it and um i've got it's 10 12 14 16 um and thankfully that they that's what they needed for this show so um it's working really really nicely so yeah so four toms um one snare but then there's lots of other bits i've got timbale i've got um some bongos i've got an sbd attached to a kick trigger and i've got a little pd8 a rolling pd8 pad which i'm sort of running some hand claps on absolutely tons of symbols lots of effect symbols i've got an ozone and a china and then just auxiliary percussion so i've got i play shaker and um tambourine 
Uh, I've got a Swanee whistle, believe it or not, uh, for a comedy moment. Um, I think that's most of it. But yeah, it's, it's certainly it's not a small small kit. Very kind of a lot of the time in theatre, you end up with this ginormous kit, which is just what the part calls for. It you have to kind of have there's so many different parts of the show, um, different um, genres of music uh, that you kind of just have to be ready for all of those things. So um, it does get a bit boring having to set it all up at the start of the week, but uh, but it's also nice for options when you get a bit bored of the show to uh, kind of throw some crazy things in, and you've got lots of things to lots of things to hit. So how does it work then in terms of deciding what kit you need for a show? Is it is it kind of is that a conversation you have with the MD, or is it are you just left to your own devices? Or yeah, no, it's definitely a conversation. So it's the kind of the music supervisor is um, the person who's in charge of the whole band, including the MD. Um, so they obviously look at the parts often they will write the parts for you. So even if the show has already existed in a previous life, um, they will rewrite the parts for this production. They'll be in the rehearsal room. Um, and as things get changed or they say, oh, we need an extra eight bars in this dance section, they're implementing that um, and putting that into the part. So there's normally a conversation kind of about a month before you start. Um, and it and it's basically saying, you know, I think we're going to need four toms. I think uh, you can, have you got a, you know, we're going to need your SPD. We're going to, um, you know, have all these bits and bobs. And um, if there's anything really out there, things that most drummers wouldn't have, um, often there's a discussion about it being provided or rented. But um, there is a, a kind of loose expectation that you need to have your kind of standard set of gear, standard set of percussion. Um, so, yeah, I end up owning lots and lots of bits of, of random stuff that, um, that when it comes out, it's always nice to have it and, uh, and be ready to go. What's, is there what's an the example one... of, yeah, are you going to say Yeah, the what's thing the one then? thing that you're like, you, you barely use, but when you do, uh, Also, there's like random bits of percussion that you end up owning. There's something called a, I think it's called a cricket clicker that sounds like a cricket chirping. Um, and I've, I've used it once ever on a show, uh, but once you've, it's kind of nice when, when it, when you need it for the show, it's really appropriate and, and really satisfying to be able to you know, provide that bit. But yeah, I mean, it's not been out of the box since. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's, I've got yeah boxes and boxes of random bits of percussion. The bongos, are they used a lot? Um, yes and no. I mean, for this show, I only, uh, there's, there's a, a loose, there's, a, there's about a two minute bongo solo uh, where it's, I, I absolutely hate it because it's very exposed, but um, I've got to keep the hi-hat on two and four Keep the, the click drops out, um, keep the hi-hat going, and the rest of the band just play dunk, dunk, and then nothing for four bars, and I have to fill that space. Uh, so it only happens for that, that two minutes in the show, um, and then they, uh, they they sit there gathering dust until the next show. Um, but, yeah, occasionally they come out for shows. There's definitely kind of a set, for certainly in musical theatre, there's, there's kind of um, the standard toolkit and, and things like bongos, are often often required for that kind of Latin section or um, or something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought. Yeah, because on a usual gig, say a function gig, you'd never bring bongos. I mean, some yeah. gigs I barely bring. You know, yeah. The I'm trying to top. think what. Yeah, what can <laughs> I was going to say? Not bring, as yeah. cool as you can get it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So bongos, but that's interesting. Yeah, certain parts of the kit that are perhaps you know always used on a theatre. Are there other parts of the kit that you'd sort of like? Is it common to have a second snare, or is that a sort of um, choice? Yeah, it's only been once I've kind of needed. I mean, the last tour I did, believe it or not, needed four snare drums, That's uh, which was that was mental, and that so is what, a, kind of a rarity. What tour was that? Um, it was Bring It On, uh, which sadly uh-huh. we we uh, we got cut, cut short. It was right in the middle of. Uh, is that based kind on of, the um, cheerleading film? It is exactly that. Um, and I've uh, seen it, it. Was written. I've seen it. Sure. Oh, we all have. We all have. Yeah. Um, that 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 was written by the same kind of music team that did Hamilton. So it's it's a wonderful score. It's kind of this kind of hip hop inspired, kind of hip hop infused pop score, I guess. And a bit like Hamilton, the the, the kit part was really specifically written. So we needed kind of a main snare drum, a popcorn snare drum which was a little kind of 12 inch snare a piccolo snare drum which is uh, i think i had a 13 by three and a half um and then an american marching snare um which it's really hard to get hold of in the uk um 
so yeah that kit was a bit bit monstrous um thankfully i i am a uh, snare drum whore and and hoards as many as i can so i had quite a few sitting there and I, uh, it was nice to have them all out on the same gig but um yeah it, that was that was a bit for a nuts one but not many other shows i think have more than one snare drum it just purely depends on the show as to as to what you need to bring really do you have yeah. a backup one just in case I do now. Yeah, I, I always. I'm a, I'm a massive um, over preparer and overthinker, so I'm always ready for that emergency. Um, so I always have a spare snare sat in a case next to my stool, basically. So um, you can quickly switch it out if if the worst was to happen. Um, it, it, it happened to me quite recently. Um, I was I was depping on on quite a, high, a kind of high pressure show, and um, I was in a drum booth on the other side of the stage, away from the rest of the band, and uh, the snare straps just broke um, right at the top of Act Two, and uh, I'd only been on I'd probably it was probably my sixth or seventh time depping on this show, so I was still fairly new. And um, I just thought, oh god, what am I going to do? And uh, the drummer, as brilliant as he is, he didn't have a spare snare drum, and it was uh, wow. a really scary. It was the longest uh, kind of five minutes of my life. Thankfully, the the sound team kind of came up and. We literally held the snare together with bits of string um, wow. and, and got away with it. But yeah, that was a good lesson. It's always have your spare uh, spare snare ready to go. Mm. Was that um, Dear Evan Hansen? That's the one, yeah. Um, so you which, met yeah. Um, Tom Coppin? Yes, the legendary Tom Coppin. He's, yeah. he's wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a real... Um, the band on that show were just incredible. I, I felt in, completely inferior and just in awe of what those guys were doing. And I was just desperately kind of clinging on, trying to keep up with them. So I had um, a few friends from uni who went on to do West End stuff, um, right. mainly brass players. So when you're filling in on a show as a drummer, are you I get, are you using their, their kit? Like you don't swap out kit, you just... Yeah, you have to use their stuff. And, and the, kind of the hardest bit, again, sort of depends on the show, but... Um, you can't really move anything. You can obviously move the odd bit, but certainly for um, Dervin Hansen, for example, the the drummer, uh, Dan Day, an incredible, incredible drummer, but he sits really low down. His snare drum's very low down. Um, I like to kind of sit sort of slightly above my knees, whereas on his drum stool, they were, it felt like they were kind of around my ears. Um, and all the microphones are set by, on that show, the American sound team had come over and and spent probably a month teching the show and so you can't i can't just whack the snare drum up because all the mics are set and and if i wanted to move then you'd probably have to you know phone america to ask permission and they'd probably say no anyway so um that's a bit of a uh kind of hard bit about zepping is you kind of have to once you get the part and the material to start learning it you have to kind of copy their setup and kind of get used to that which um can be that was kind of almost the most challenging thing on that show particularly was just dealing it's a completely different way of um playing and uh, uh you can you get there in the end but it's always a bit scary you kind of just wish you could be on your kit on your setup and, and feeling kind of comfortable yeah. that's like a double whammy isn't it yeah of, we've we've spoken a lot about control what you can control and and having your setup being how you like it is it's really that's important it. and then all the variables you can you can adapt to a lot easier but not only are you depping on a big profile show in the west end but you're on someone else's kit then you can't move anything that's, yeah that's quite i was kind to of deal with. yeah liken it to driving somebody else's car you know if you can you can normally kind of get by and you can get the car moving and, and, and drive safely but you can't drive perfectly you're probably you know depending on what car it is you know you you'll kind of lurch on the clutch or your your stool or something like that and unfortunately in that setting you can't you have to drive perfectly you have to be um, relatively flawless, um, and you don't really get a run up to it. You don't, you can't sort of go and do a, a rehearsal with the band. The, the first time you play is on the actual performance, so it's it's pretty terrifying. Um, yeah. That one, I, not not all drummers have kind of. I mean, I tend to kind of set my gear up in a very sort of standard way now, just purely that if I do dip it out, it's kind of um, easy for someone to step in and things are roughly where where they should be, but. Yeah, it's definitely the kind of I find that the, the the hardest part of it, I think, is is playing other people's gear. It, it adds a whole new dynamic to trying mm. to play a show. So then, filling in for something like a West End show, because um, obviously we in the wedding game we're very used to depths, but it's a very standard set. And ultimately, yes, it's someone's wedding, but 
the pressure ain't too high when you compare it to a West End show. So what's that preparation like for yourself? Because as you just said, first time you're playing it, it's bang, you're you're in the show. How, how yeah. much do you do? Like what for yourself just personally, what's between, I don't know, like you get the call and how how maybe what what sort of lead up time do you have between getting booked and and the first show yeah it's it, it kind of it varies um i i'm a massive over preparer i i like to be as you know as prepared as possibly can be and a little bit more um not everyone's like that a lot of people are more laid back and easy going and uh, go with the flow but um ultimately with stepping is you have to be kind of on your a game there's no there's no room for um, being kind of below par and you're, you're, you're going into a setting with a band that have played that show, you know, maybe 300, 400 times. And so the slightest differences is going to be huge to them. Um, and so you have to be kind of ready for any of those scenarios. So for me, I mean, in an ideal world, I'd like, I'd like a month, I'd like four weeks to learn a new show. If I, it, it, certainly for that kind of that level from like a West end show, um, yeah, I like to kind of spend a couple of weeks with the part, making my own notes, studying it, and then a couple of weeks of getting it under my hands, you know, a week of, of getting it under my hands and then, and then a week of kind of really polishing it, testing myself, getting my family to come and watch me and put pressure on me while I'm playing it, um, just to really try and put yourself into that situation um, that you're ready. And But, I mean, at a real push, you could probably, if there was an emergency, you could probably jump on something within two weeks, I think, if you work really hard. Um but uh, for me, I kind of get my confidence from knowing I've done all I can do. I can't do anything more than that. Um, and, and so I kind of always just put everything I've got into it if I can. And yeah, I mean, I haven't, I've done loads and loads of kind of stepping in the West End. It's still kind of relatively new to me. It's something I want to get more into. But um, it's a kind of whole emotional roller coaster of, of kind of building yourself up, handling your nerves and, um, and getting it done without completely screwing it up. <laughs> yeah. So do you get given like, um a copy of the charts and what audio do they give you is it a recording of that live show do they do they like tape yeah. a few so they can send it to you and be like we've got this current production on audio yeah. so we can send it to depths or do they have like a studio recording or watch the film yeah, so, you know yeah <laughs> come down come um, to the west end come and watch it yeah um so yeah they'll send over a kind of a photocopy of the parts and and that will often have their notes in it so um, that's kind of quite important. And then they'll send you a, a normally a video recording off the conductor with the kind of audio um, from their personal mix. So kind of it, it's, it's kind of industry standard that every musician on a musical theatre show will have their own little mixer, um, like an Avion or a, there's a Roland, um, I can't think what they're called, but um, uh, you can basically, you can choose what you're listening to because obviously everyone, every different chair has different requirements um, as to what mix they need. Um, so you, you'll often get that mix, which is quite handy because that's what you're ultimately going to start with on the night. And and then you obviously, yeah, you're obviously following the conductor, um, start to every conductor, such a different style as to where they play on their, on their downbeat. And, and often, for shows that the conductor will also be playing a piano. So you're having to follow them nodding their head. And so you, you just have to get to know where everyone is placing things and, um, and be kind of ready for that. Uh, it, the, again, that's another kind of problem with deafing is often the recording you get could have been from a year ago on the show and the band don't realize this, but the show's slightly changed at certain points since then things are played slightly faster or slightly slower or the MD is less flamboyant with their conducting and and uh so again you always have to be ready to kind of think on your feet uh sometimes you find yourself thinking oh this isn't this isn't the same as a video but uh you also can normally go in as many times as you want go and sit next to the um to the drummer and watch them play the show watch the conductor from from that night and and start to kind of get an idea of what it feels like to be in the drum booth and um what the conductor is currently doing well, that, yeah. speaking of drum booth, I, I, I scrolled through your Instagram today and I, uh, I saw there well, was... I, I was, I was doing it four weeks ago, mate. Yeah. Uh, four weeks it. leading time. Yeah. For... <laughs> I like to be spontaneous in my interviews. Um, oh, yeah. And I saw, I can't remember what the show was, but it showed you're in this amazing theatre, but 
you were sort of in a very closed off drum cocoon type thing um and i you know under the a state prison cell a prison cell oh, yeah. for drummers um i mean that's obviously the way it is you're under the stage does that do you lose any sort of feeling of the audience when you're underground essentially or is yeah, it yeah massively yeah, yeah. It's, it's again that's a, it's a very um often when you're in a pit and you're in a drum booth within a pit and it's very dark and um you, it's a very kind of isolating clinical feel um you 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 rarely hear much audience noise um and you do feel incredibly detached and, and even though you can kind of sometimes if you're in the pit you can see the front row they're not paying any attention to you you kind of feel very very detached and the mix that you listen to is is a really kind of raw sometimes kind of uninspiring sound and that's something that you have to kind of get used to most of the the band will be on in ears um which also give you a really kind of clinical um feel and you have to kind of i mean i think this goes across not just in theater but you kind of have to develop this trust that the sound team in front of house are making you sound incredible and actually what the audience listening to is is going to be a whole world away from what you're listening to um so you kind of have to play almost imagining that it sounds incredible um that you know it sounds absolutely pumping i mean on the show at the moment the share show more often than not the band are remote which means that you're in a room completely detached from the theater sometimes you're on the other side of the building i mean wow. i think the the next thing you were doing we're in porter cabins out the back of the theater um because there's there's not much space backstage in the theater because you've got four um, four toms mate that's why that's it yes, that's it's it. yeah. the bongos i tell you and um so it's a really really strange experience and it's really easy to forget that there's an audience there and they've all paid a load of money to be yeah. there and, and you kind of have to i i have to really sort of give myself a talking to when you've done your you're on your seventh show of the week um you have to kind of really remind yourself that actually people are seeing this show for the first time and you have to give it your all and remember you know you can't mess around you you know you've got, you've got to make it sound great um but yeah the drum booth is a tough one you feel very sort of condensed the, the drum booths in general don't sound great i mean the, the one we're using at the moment is the kind of perspex screens with some of the kind of um the the muffle pads attached to it but it, it gives them, it, it's really hard to actually tune the drums nicely in that space. You get a lot of slap back from the, from the perspex and um, everything sounds incredibly dead and lifeless. And so you, I, I spend kind of a good hour every week really listening to the microphones, getting, you know, the, the muffling right for the drums, um, trying to, trying to get a consistent sound, but without it sounding completely naff, basically. Yeah. Do, you, do you know why it might be a combination of the two, but is, is put, you know, these drum booths, I know it's even like a lot more common in orchestras now to have perspex, you know, in front of the horn sections and percussion. Yeah. Is is its main reason to protect hearing of the other band members or is it to have more control over the front of house sound if you if you completely sort of isolate uh, yeah. it? Yeah. I think it's a, it's a, it's a perfect mix of both of those things. I mean there's there's been all kinds of um quite major things that have been happening recently with certainly in orchestras with, uh, you know, the brass section not being isolated enough and, and actually other players in the orchestra damaging their hearing because it just gets so noisy. So it, so that is kind of a, a really big priority is making sure everyone is kind of safe and comfortable. And also, that you know, if, if the bass player is set right in front of the drums, um, their mix, you know, you, no matter how good their innards are, they're going to be getting some bleed from, from the acoustic drums. So um, I think that's really important. But equally i think you're changing theater every week and we spent you know two weeks taking the show with a sound designer and what we're trying to do is is recreate a consistent space every week so um you know we try and get the drum booth and the, the mic positions identical every week if we can and i really try and tune all my drums identically every week so that we kind of consistently get the same sound and it's incredible how just a different, slightly different space affects. I mean, you guys know from, from working in studios and things, the, the space makes such difference to the sound of the gear. So the drum booth, it massively helps with that, I think, just kind of, it, otherwise, you know, some weeks we're in a in the loading dock out the back of the theatre, which is, you know, like an aircraft hangar. And, and the drum sound would be completely different if we didn't have the drum booth there. So I think it helps with that. 
does it get to a point where you know the show so well that it does become i don't want to say boring i don't you know i don't want to say uninteresting but is it does it get to a point say on the longest show you've done where you go you get sick of it <laughs> yeah i kind of i don't want to like say that yeah i mean i mean i'm eagerly having to you know what should i say here but yeah, yeah realistically yes of course you have you know things do go a bit stale it, it was easy for things to go a bit stale and get boring um and it's a you know i think i said earlier you know you get better at touring you get better doing shows the more that you do a, a big part of that is is understanding yourself understanding how to get the best out of yourself and you know this this kind of ties into mental health and uh, you know everything associated with that but yeah massively after about kind of three months really you know it, it really does get very samey um, and depending on what show you're on you know some shows require you to play exactly the same part every single night and not add in anything extra other shows are a lot a lot free i mean the show i'm at the moment um we can kind of there's a there's a, a line to tread carefully but you can kind of do what you want as long as you're sort of following the, the theme of the music but i mean there's this whole mental journey you go through and it's kind of dips and troughs constantly off um you know there'll be points where you you, you when you start a show you feel amazing and you feel oh, this is great the band sound amazing and we're getting tied to every show and then you kind of go through this dip often of of you overanalyze everything you do because you, you, you've done it so often now and the parts become second nature you then go oh god i sound rubbish i mean that feel what am i doing and you might mess up the same part of the show two shows in a row and you go oh, what am i doing and you forget to, how to play the drums almost you kind of go you're so used to playing those specific parts that you kind of go i've completely lost my ability to do anything else um and you have to really try and keep yourself going and, and kind of ride out those moments and and you know you'll go through you know if you get through that stage you then go through another stage of you know god the band sound better than ever at the moment and yeah i've got a great drum sound this week but there's yeah definitely is, is a big part of it is trying to do what you can to keep it fresh i mean as silly as it sounds i, I like to read a book in between numbers i like to um read a book you you know you shouldn't really be on your phone or anything like that when you're when you're working but um i think uh, as long as it doesn't distract you too much, you know, reading a book is allowed. And um, it's just something different every show. We're playing the same show eight times a week, but my book is constantly changing because it's a new chapter each time. Mm. And uh, that kind of, uh, I've learned that really helps me um, just to kind of keep my, br my brain active um, and, and stop yourself. Otherwise, you could just kind of lose Can where you say, are, what time well, it's yeah. I love that the book almost becomes, yeah. The that's the interesting part yeah. of the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That Matt, we're ready. I got a yeah. minute. Yeah, it's reading catch <laughs> Honestly, on the rye here. Yeah. yeah, I have to be so careful. To, I have to be really strict to myself. Okay, I'm, I'm ready now. Lines, yeah. yeah, it's like you know, I have to put the deck away because if you want a really good chapter, a really good chapter. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I mean, even just down to, I mean, I mean, winter we saw each other in IKEA. I think we were we were playing Southampton, and it was such a luxury to have an IKEA in the centre of town. And I think we went three times that week for dinner there because we are so used to having to go and find some dinner in between shows and it's the usual it's the same old places there's only so many times you can have a sandwich from press or um or, or something like that and actually we were like god it's something different and that that was a real highlight of, of that month's worth of touring is oh we've got an ikea um I'm surprised you only went three of... times matt <laughs> I, I wanted to go more but yeah the rest <laughs> of the band and, and yeah so it is it's those kind of things that you have to you know, I, I've again. I, I sound like an old git now, but um, prioritizing sleep. I realised if I if I get a proper good night's sleep, my my ears feel better. I, you know, everything sounds better. The the click on the show feels more comfortable and and sometimes a bit slower and and things like that. Um, it, it's kind of really looking after yourself to stop yourself basically going insane because it is essentially Groundhog Day. It's the same thing. Yeah um most days and um anything you can do to keep it fresh is is, is worth it basically you've done some international touring with shows but i want to hone in on something i saw on your instagram where you broke a symbol yeah but you were in turkey yeah in, yeah in istanbul were you that's right yeah in istanbul um, sounds I'm, like a good story 
full disclaimer, you know, I, I haven't done tons of uh, international touring. Um, but yeah, that that was a, a really kind of cushy. Uh, we, we did a couple of weeks in Dubai, a couple of weeks in Istanbul and a couple of weeks in, in Italy and maybe somewhere else. But it was only a short run. But um, yeah, I was I was in uh, in Istanbul and, and yeah, broke a symbol. And I thought, oh, God, what the hell am I going to do now? And, you know, and then realized, of course, you know, I'm literally in the, the home of the birthplace of the symbol. Um, and, and went and found some wonderful, wonderful drum shops there um, and, and came away with some goodies, which was nice. Um, which actually bring it, I mean, I've completely forgotten the story now, but um, while we were in Istanbul, um, Victor Wooten was in town um, playing some shows with, his, with the trio, with Dennis Chambers on drums. And um, we were playing in this big theatre complex where there were several music venues there. We were in the theatre. Um, and then when you're doing international touring, they often sort out the accommodation for you. So you get put up in a hotel and you get taken on a bus back and forth. So we were staying probably about, I don't know, 45 minutes away in this, in this really nice hotel. And we'd gone to the hotel bar um, that evening and I turned around and Dennis Chambers was stood at the bar by himself. And it, you know, he'd obviously just finished the show himself and the same promoters had obviously put him up at the same hotel. And I was kind of with, with my bandmates and I was like, I, I I I can't go and bother the man. He's a legend. I can't I can't go and and after a few drinks they were like, if you don't if you don't go say hi now, you're going to regret this forever. And um, so I kind of uh, very shyly went up and you know sort of said, you know, Dennis, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, you know, so I, I really wanted to catch the show tonight, but unfortunately I was I was working um, on a different show. Um, How did it all go? And tried to start a conversation and. Uh, and he looked a little bit kind of hassled. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Would you mind if I just grab a quick photo? I had a photo. And then I sort of said, honestly, it's been, you know, such an honor to meet you. And he went, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, go, wow. thank you. I think out of everyone in the world, I think maybe Dennis Chavers can get away with saying that and, and meaning it. But um, yeah, that was a, a wonderful memory from, um, from Turkey, the most bizarre um, meeting ever. But uh yeah, what a legend. Yeah. That's, uh, what a phrase. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something I'd say. Yeah. Far, so, uh, yeah. yeah, you should be on it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, let's move. Let's go back in time. Back to before the world of theatre. Did you did you study drums anywhere? You must have done. Yeah, so I, um, I was really lucky. I went to a place called the Brit School, which um, oh. is... Uh, it's a performing arts college basically but but you study in your strand obviously i studied music there but i was very lucky there because there was there is the British also, school and it's in croydon it's kind of near uh, selhurst train station if anyone knows what that is and it's uh it's a great place the, the, the amazing thing about the British school is it's state funded it's one of the only places in the country so um there's no fees i mean it's, it's completely free to go there and i think because of that the audition process is absolutely nuts trying to get in there and I, I don't still to this day don't know why they let me in um but uh they did and i kind of really made sure that i i kind of used my spot wisely and um is that i age, knew by is that for 18 is that is it post college uh, is it 18, six... yeah so it's kind of for a level age isn't it so yeah so so i, I yeah yeah I, I forget what the years are now but um yeah so, so it's, instead of doing a levels i went there oh, okay. and did yep. sort of uh a national diploma i think it was called but very lucky to go there they've got incredible facilities there you know they, they had a whole midi suite and the recording studio there was incredible um and i'd already kind of worked out that i really enjoyed doing theater playing from being in secondary school and um so literally on my second day there i think i went and found the musical theater office and knocked on the door and said i really want to do theater can i can i come play for some of your shows and um Thankfully, they, they let me, I think I played pretty much every performance they did um, across the two years I, I went and played for, which was kind of a really good education for me um, to kind of learn that side of things. They, they used to bring in um, kind of outside musicians, people that are working in the West End and, and, and beyond. And um, so I got to meet them and pick their brains and, and, and kind of gain experience that way. Um, so that was really, really valuable. And, and, uh, and then, well, yeah, by the time I finished at the British School, I was looking at universities and I looked at um, conservatoires and I looked at the kind of more um, popular music courses like ACM and, and BIM and neither one of them felt 
massively right for me, certainly the conservatoires where most of them are offering classical percussion or jazz drumming. Um, and I didn't necessarily want to kind of pigeonhole myself into either of those two at that point. And, and ACM and BIM and, and those places also looked absolutely incredible, but, but quite similar to what I've been doing at, at the Brit School. So um, I did the kind of cliche thing of going, oh, I'll give myself give myself a year and see what happens. Um, and I w- just purely by luck and coincidence, I, I managed to find myself some, some really good work um, playing for a kind of a pop artist back then. And, and to be honest, the rest is history, really. It all kind of stemmed from that. I, I, um, I kind of managed to get out touring doing kind of one-nighters. And, and thankfully, I've sort of been winging it ever since, been trying to make that work. Because <laughs> uh, I know you, um, at the sort of time, you were stepping for a decade in Victoriana. I remember yeah. there was a point where you were just done a you ended up you were playing for Joe McEldry. That's right, yeah. When when did that sort of happen? Cuz that was um cuz he won the X Factor. Was that um, yeah, like early won... on in your career or was that a bit later That was on? one of the first things I did. Yeah, okay. that was a, that was kind of a really big turning point for me. Um How did I was, that come I was relatively about? Um I actually met his manager by by pure coincidence, one of those kind of um those pure chance meetings they talk about where um I was with a friend um I think we were just doing some shopping in Oxford Street and, and she sort of said, oh, I just want to meet up with a friend for, for, for some coffee. Do you want to come? And that, um, that at the time was Joe jo McElge's manager. Um, and she was talking about um, looking for a new band for Joe. And he, I was this kind of fresh-faced, inexperienced kind of uh, boy back then. And, and thankfully, she uh, kind of agreed to let me come and audition. And I know for Joe at that point, they were really looking for... Um, a band that would be a really nice environment to be around. They were looking, not, not, they weren't just looking for great players. They were looking for um, just nice people, nice people that got on with Joe that he felt comfortable with. And so, I, you know, a, a month later, I, I think actually for, for that, they asked me to go and meet Joe first at his hotel um, for for some dinner with uh, with with his, some of his family were there too. And um, I think they just wanted to see how you know, if we got on, if, if we clicked and, um, thankfully we did. Joe's an absolute legend. He's a, he's a, he's a lovely, lovely man. And that led to me getting an audition with his MD. And I'm pretty sure the end, I was, I mean, with, I was so inexperienced back then. I still have no idea how I got the gig, but, um, I'm pretty sure the MD was like, absolutely not. But for some reason they, they agreed to have me. And, um, it was a very, very quick learning curve to, to kind of keep up. They had a really great band. Um, who have all gone on to do absolutely massive things. And yeah, I mean, you know, that very quickly led uh, back then at 2012, Joe was still working with a record label. And so we were, he was releasing his fourth album and we were doing kind of album launch shows and um, we were doing some of the, the TV, like playing on Loose Women, miming on Loose Women. And, um, you know, and I, you know, I'd, I'd really recently left college. This was an absolute dream for me, you know, sort of nice hotels and, um, you know, I think we ended up playing Hyde Park during the Olympics. And there's a massive stage there, and we did we did a set there. So um, it was absolutely incredible um, to get that. And, and to be honest, I think I stayed. I did about four or five years after that with Joe. Um, you know, with the odd other bit mixed in, but um, he just kind of kept touring and kept touring, and um, loads and loads of one nighters basically. And um, it was such a great education for me to. Um, just down to learning material and um, he eventually got a new manager and the new manager really pushed me to work on performance. And that's something I'd never done before, but he was, he was, you know, really wanted the band to be part of the show rather than just kind of awkwardly at the back and, and, and really forced me out of my comfort zone. And again, really grateful for that just to kind of know that I, you know, I, I can do that now, sort of find that in myself to kind of, uh, even though I'm sort of hating it at the time, um, to you know look up and, and perform a little bit and, and lift my hands a bit higher and all that stuff and then how did how did you transition from that into the, the theatre yeah so I was all I was I think I was still doing lots of kind of very small scale things lots of you know um you know kind of two week long productions at drama schools and and some of the very small theatres in London um so kind of starting to get to know musicians and MDs and then what was actually I mean, again, another very, very lucky chance meeting. Um, Joe McEldry had started working as he's doing Joseph the musical, Joseph and the Technical Dreamcoat. 
produced by Bill Kenwright, who um, is a is a big theatre producer. He's also, I think he might be the chairman of Everton Football Club. Uh, but uh, Joe went off and did a production of that. And then I think Bill Kenwright decided, oh, I'd love to put out a Joe McEldry show, a one-nighter show to basically produce it and direct it. And, and um, thankfully, they, they agreed to let Joe use the band I was in. So I found myself in a room with Bill Kenwright and all of his music team, all of his kind of head of music and, and music And the Everton writers. squad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and we basically spent a week rehearsing this show we were putting out. And I, I mean, I, I knew, I knew that these people were quite a big deal within the theatre world and, and I was really, really nervous and they were giving nothing away. They all kind of sat with their arms crossed behind a table. And at the end of the week, they, they sort of said, Matt, when did she finish packing down? Can you just come and meet us in the, the pub across the road? I thought, oh, this is it. I'm, I'm going to get fired. They hate me. And um, and and again, just really lucky. They sort of said, you know, we really like what you've been doing this week. You know, we're looking for a drummer for the next tour of Joseph. Um, would you be up for doing it? And 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 I literally grabbed it with both hands. And uh, so yeah, so my first kind of proper proper tour, I guess, in theatre was was Joseph. And and again, I look back now, no idea how I kept the job. I was so inexperienced. Um, and I just kind of, we, I think we did a day of band rehearsals in the theatre and then we opened the next day. And yeah, I've literally been clinging on for dear life ever since, basically. I'm just hoping no one, no one actually realises I can't actually play the drums that well. Well, this is something uh, else. Can I just say, I've got one last theatre question before we go on to yeah. what we're going to end with. Um, have you heard the term a never again in theatre? Yeah. Right. I it. have to discuss this. What is never again? Yeah, so it often gets shorted, shortened to NA, and it's yeah, it's the it's the the most fearful word that we're all running from. Um, it, basically, if you come in as a musician and you are not up to standard, or if you come in as a debt and you're and you're not good enough, you you basically get NA. You don't always know that you've you don't know that it's been happened, um, but you you get never again, and and it's a pretty serious uh, sort of death sentence, really. It's uh, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, mean I'm, I think with most industries out there, um, news travels very quickly. It's a very kind of gossipy, um, gossipy world. You know, everyone kind of knows everyone. And, and uh, it's part of the pressure of doing theatre, I think, is you, you, you can never really afford to do a bad show because um, you, you can kind of gain a reputation for it very quickly. Um, uh, and, yeah, there's, um, unfortunately, I've, I've seen that happen quite a few times. People get NA'd. And, and it's not always because their playing wasn't up to scratch it. Some, sometimes more often than not, it's their personality doesn't fit. You know, they've come in being a bit arrogant or a bit um, hard to get along with, or, you know, certain kind of misdemeanors. And um, it's very, very easy to get yourself on the, on the NA list. And, um, Am I right in saying once you're on it, that's it for theatre shows in the UK? <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah. I, I it's certainly very hard to come back from it. I, I mean, mm. it, it does happen. And, um, you know, if you, if you kind of work hard, get your head down and, and kind of learn from perhaps your mistakes, um, you know, p- people, people do come back from it, but yeah, it's certainly not a list you want to be on it. Um, no. it was sort of the main question I wanted to ask you because I, I, I asked you because there was a tutor when I went to BIM who did a, he depth for a West End show and he was telling us about, the never again list and i was yeah. like that can't be a thing surely he's just telling us 18 year olds it to like sound dramatic or something but i thought if i ask you and you're like oh, i've not heard of that i don't know but the fact <laughs> that like, oh no 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 <laughs> the end yeah. list is a thing like in it mostly in theater you get booked by fixers um so the kind of two really important people in theater as a, a instrumentalist are is your fixer the person who books you and your music supervisor who is basically in charge of the music of that production that you're doing. Um, and the fixer is the one who has a kind of a, a black book of everyone that they know. And I don't know how they do it. I'm sure some of them keep, you know, little, I'm sure they've got next to the contact details in the phone, they've got, you know, n- notes about who they are, what they've done, you know, how good they are. But, they, you know, at the top of the theatre world, there's probably only, I don't know, five to ten fixers that are basically fixing everything um there's certainly one or two that you know pretty much do most of the big shows in town and so they all know each other and they're all friends with each other and and so 
if they are thinking about trying out this new drummer or this, this new musician that they've not had, they'll pick up the phone and talk to people. So it, it, you have to really always try and be at your best because word gets around very quickly. People are always asking, oh, wh- what did you think of this person? How did that person do on that job? And it, and it, and you know, like I said, it goes beyond just the playing. It's, it's, you know, um, probably the number one rule specifically in theatre, but of course with everything is don't be a dick. It's, mm. it's, you know, be self-conscious, be, um, aware of the people around you. You're, you're basically in this pressure cooker environment. You're trapped in this dark hole under the stage for, for, you know, months of the year. And, and you have to be able to get, get, get along with everyone and not drive each other mental. Um, so, you know, yeah, always, always being at your best, always trying to get on with everyone is, is a big part of it. Something you sort of mentioned and something you brought up in your email when I got in touch with you about coming on here was imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> and you kind of mentioned it, but get the impression you don't feel like you deserve to be where you are. Is that right? Yeah, I mean... I, I mean, you know, it was lovely to hear from you and, and, you know, very flattering that you're up for having this conversation today. But no, I kind of, me, I, I think I didn't reply for about three or four days and I was just sat going, oh my God, like, you know, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to, I'm, you know, I've become a big fan of the podcast now. And, and it, um, but I kind of feel like uh, there's so many way more successful, better drummers that you could be chatting to. You know, I almost sent you their names and their numbers. And, yeah, I mean, and you know, full disclaimer, I'm definitely nowhere near the top of the kind of theatre world. I'm still still trying to work the whole thing out and uh, and and sort of chipping away, um, trying to keep going. But I think a lot of people have it this this idea of imposter syndrome where you um, you never feel kind of quite adequate enough. You never feel good enough to be what you're doing. And and you know, I, there is a a huge part of my career that I know is down to kind of coincidence and luck and. I've always just absolutely worked my socks off to try and kind of keep up with it and uh, try and sort of make up. You know, I, in my mind, I've still got loads and loads of practice I still need to do. And, and yeah, I still need to be way better than I am at the moment. And I sort of feel like I'm always playing like, you know, catch ups. Like, you know, I hope that my, you know, the fixer or the supervisor doesn't realize that actually, you know, I'm I'm absolutely blagging this. And, you know, there's this, there's this um, like one minute, latin drum break that happens under this massive dance sequence and you know i'm like i only know like four latin like licks and you know and and you're like going home after the first band call going like trying to find some like latin grooves that you can put into the playing and but i think what i've gained through kind of just experience really i mean i've I've been working in theater you know sort of touring with theater for like the last sort of seven or eight years um which is mental i mean if that there's people that have been doing far more than i have been on much bigger shows but you have to kind of remind yourself you know that i have that you've managed to do the things that you've done and if you look back at yourself you know i sort of said that my first show that the big the kind of first professional show i did was joseph and i think back to that first day kind of looking at the conductor we um going i've got no idea what i'm supposed to be following here you know he's, he's waving his hand at me i don't know what that means um you know i've learned so much since then um and I think really, I get, you know, talking to my missus, you know, she was saying that maybe the imposter syndrome is, is partly to do with the, the, the sort of successes that I have had is, is, is always feeling like I need to work a bit harder and always need to be doing that extra bit of work and always feeling kind of conscious, never getting complacent, always feeling like I need to be trying to be at my very best all the time. Actually, that's the, the hard work that shows to the people that matter um, that you've you, you, you've really kind of put your work in and that you really want to make it work. But it's still something that I battle with all the time. I mean, it gets easier to, to live with the, the sort of the, the more years you, you go on and the more experience you gain, you can kind of ignore the voices in your head and go, it's okay. I've, I've done this before. You know, I've, I've got some experience under me now and, and you kind of trust that. But um, I have a feeling it's obviously that's never going to go away. I think it's always something to be, battling with and um pushing myself to be better and uh, and that side of things well i mean matt you're such a nice guy and you're such a good drummer and as you said you've been, <laughs> you've been doing this for years now so like from the outside looking into your career it's like you are successful and you are oh, bless you, you are doing what so many people would love to be able to do and you're using 
maybe those imposter syndrome insecurities, you're using them to keep yourself on your game and keep yourself up to date and well rehearsed and well prepared. And that's really important and you don't want to slide into an element of complacency. And I have a very, me and George have said with this podcast, who are we? Who are we to be <laughs> chatting to all these amazing drummers? Yeah. And, you know, we, we do a few weddings and whatever, but like someone's got to do it. Mm. And what it does is it makes us go, it makes us, it keeps us going and going, how can we make this show better? Who can we talk to next? What can we do to improve it? And I have it massively with, with the studio mixing, you know, but it makes me go, well, I've got to make this next mix the best mix I've ever done. That's it. And, and, but people looking in see me owning a studio and recording and they see George playing drums, professional, you know, and they go, there's so many people who'd love to be doing that. And a key phrase I think is that I've heard, which I think resonates is if you're surviving, you, especially in this industry, if you're surviving, you are successful. So yeah. Don't be too hard on yourself, Matt. You're, you've got an incredible career. I mean, you're playing West End. You're touring the UK, like in South. You're you're consistently working. Um, but I understand what you're thinking. But just Definitely, know, yeah, thank you. We we love what you're doing. Yeah, um, and it's it's, it's nice. Amazing what it's nice. It's, it's nice when you talk to someone that says, you know, I was lucky to get that gig, rather than like, oh, yeah, I turned up and they were lucky to have me. Not that. <laughs> Like well, most people we've spoken to, whatever whatever their level, like the the people who are doing doing well and enjoying themselves, are the ones who are humble, who are yeah, yeah. appreciative, and who know that. I think for anyone in the creative industries, it could be over tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, it yeah, could be time. over tomorrow through some, whether it's you get put on the NA list or you break your arm, something happens. It, it could all be over. There's no real ongoing security and if you if you make sure that you know you have to kind of meet neil at the studio we talk about we've got to prove ourselves to be able to do the next job that next job will only come if we prove that we can do this one right now so we're earning the right to do the next thing and that means you have to keep being conscious of your level and your standard and being prepared and making sure you're you're doing all the right things but there's yeah, it's definitely days where I think I don't know fucking anything about mixing or recording. There's so many mm. people out there doing it better than me. But I've been doing. I've just celebrated my 10 year anniversary of owning this studio. And that's it's like, incredible. Yeah, and that's congratulations. The that is absolutely amazing. Thank you. So I understand your thoughts about it, but mate, you're doing brilliant. So and it's great to see. And it was lovely to bump into you the other week. And um it's great to, uh yeah we just re- really we want to talk to anyone like, like not anyone we want to talk to her <laughs> like you are you are playing great in the barrel full yes. time <laughs> touring big shows and definitely in the west end like every every drummer's got a different story everyone's got a different path different experiences and this is something like i've seen a tiny bit of the west end world from brass from back in uni days yeah but like the, there's so many people who want to see what here from um, peek behind the curtain not just the curtain but down the pit into the the, the container <laughs> yeah, outside and into thing, the yeah. drum booth I mean, like <laughs> yeah. that's insane that you're in a completely set you're in a shipping container out the back mm. yeah well show. i mean i feel like you know having said that you know i feel like i've, I've not necessarily made the theater world sound that great but you know it's it's an absolutely wonderful wonderful job and i and i do feel incredibly lucky to kind of still be be working within it um if there's anyone out there that has ever kind of wondered about doing it um i think there's a lot of misconceptions i think people think you have to be this incredible sight reader and um you have to know all these different styles of playing and there is an extent where you eventually yes you need to be able to kind of be good at reading and you need to know lots of different styles but initially um you know you can depending on what job it is you can ask for the parts a few weeks before you start the rehearsal so you can you can really study the music. You can, you know, take your time with it. You can listen to a if, it, if it's a show that's been done before. You can listen to the cast recording on Spotify and and and, and pick out bits like that. And it's uh, you know, I've always enjoyed theatre because it sounds really cheesy, this, but you are you are just one small vital cog in this massive machine. I know that's cheesy, but um, it's a real thrilling experience. Once the best you, cog. you kind of. Yeah, well, you know, most most important maybe I don't know, um, but uh, you 
once the show finishes and you you know there's all these different departments there's people on the, the fly floor bringing the set up and down there's people doing the wigs and the costumes and um the lighting and the sound and you, everyone is working at this incredibly high level that you have to up your game to be a part of you you know no one is slacking no one is, is on an easy ride everyone has to be on it eight shows a week every week and there's something really I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and there's something really satisfying about being a part of that and, and bringing your a game and you know getting away with it you know being a part of that machine and and, and everything running smoothly and i massively recommend if anyone has a chance to to work in theater or panto is, is a good kind of a good way in perhaps um or um local amdram or local drama school things like that you know get in touch give it a try um it, it's it's a really sort of exciting thing to be a part of if you kind of can deal with all the other bits like the monotony and the things like that but um overall it's still i still kind of pinch myself and go this is this is amazing this, this feels really really good that's awesome man yeah, yeah. before you go we've got one final question yeah. for you who's your favorite delivery company <laughs> um i'm kind of hmm dpd are doing are doing it for me at the moment i like the the hour time slot that you get um at the moment ups are supposed to be delivering a new macbook today and it's all gone very quiet and i haven't i don't think it's going to come today so they're in my bad my bad books at the moment but um but yeah i haven't i don't think i've had any issues with dpd i think they might be on top for me okay yeah Good any choice. bad delivery stories um not massively i mean i mean amazon i don't know if they count as a, as a, as a delivery service but there's always things going missing for me with them, you know, things that says it's been delivered and, and all sorts. And the whole thing of you having a notification to say we've attempted delivery, but you know you were sat by the door and no one knocked. I mean, that yeah. drives me crazy. Um, but no, I don't think I've had any of the real bad ones that you see. Um, have you guys got any special ones? No, but I always like to ask because it's. I asked that question at the end. And after Ben's asked, who's your favorite? I like to now go, any bad stories? <laughs> And people kind of go, hmm, for a second. And I'm like, oh, was that a shit question to ask? And then sometimes... And then there's usually one thing that comes out. Yeah, and then they'll go, oh, actually, you won't believe what happened with Yodel. And then that'll be it for 10 minutes. Yeah. And rant. And it's always good to get those little little stories of bad deliveries. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Another, another vote for DPD, though. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, might, might be on top for me, I think. Yeah. I like the out window. Yeah, it's yeah. nice. Good. <laughs> listen matt thanks so much for joining us yeah pleasure to thank you for having me it's been an absolute pleasure guys and uh enjoy the rest of the tour how long have you got left we're, we're not long now uh four weeks left i think so yeah we're really counting down have you got anything planned after the tour uh I, yeah i've just i've just had the call actually um i haven't find out all the kinks i'm not gonna say exactly what it is but it's something it's a, it's a theater show completely different it's uh perhaps aimed at the younger audience and uh it's going to be on stage as in it's a theater show but the drums are going to be on stage and and there's going to be a bit of i think walking to the front and playing gahan and certain numbers and and sort of being a part of the action lots of sound effects and things like that so yeah so hopefully that all comes off i'm just kind of finalizing the details but um yeah if anyone ever wants to get in touch and, and come and sit in with me or or ask questions please feel free to uh to come do it brilliant definitely Awesome, Matt. Enjoy the rest of the tour. And we'll, um, Thanks we'll see so you much, soon. guys. Cheers, Chat mate. soon. Bye. Bye. There we go. That was Matt Billups. What a modest man. Modest man. Lovely man. Lovely man. And uh, be you proud know, of yourself, not, Matt. Yeah, it's not luck. You know, it's uh, clearly a wonderful drummer. And well, a, I think there's luck and there's chances, aren't there, that everyone yeah. has in their careers. I think the real lesson is you've got to be ready for when those... You've got to be ready. And it's that thing of like, you know, people always say, oh, I was in the right place at the right time when they end up getting a good gig. But you have to be good enough to do the gig as well. You can't That's just what I mean. you be got to there. be yeah. ready for it. Yeah, so exactly. So an opportunity falls, things align. Yeah. Are you up to it? And if not quite, but are you going to do the work to make sure you're up for it? Yeah. You know? Exactly. And he clearly is because he's constantly touring in those damn theatres. And I think the craziest part, I think we both discussed it, was how 
when he's playing, sometimes he's not even in the under the stage. He'll be in a yeah. That was yeah. mental. That blew my mind. Like that disconnect from the audience. You're not yeah. only, you know, not in the like on the stage, but you might actually be in a trailer or whatever he said you know yeah which is wild it must be but, very uh, easy to just not give a shit yeah <laughs> yeah there's nothing there's, you get nothing you're, in, you're literally in a port cabin yeah playing drums and the fact that you can read a book between <laughs> songs that's <laughs> wild you know i, I mean? did a um i did one sit in in a pit at the mayflower actually my friend oh, steve yeah. was a trombone player and uh, he was doing a touring show of fame oh you know, yeah. leroy and <laughs> 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 why is that funny <laughs> you, you get it um, yeah and he was like I'm in Southampton do you want to come sit in so I went and sat in, in the pit and there was a sax player in the pit uh-huh. and he's he'd been you could tell he'd been touring these, like a touring theatre sax player yeah. for about 40 years yeah and if you think I'm dead to it <laughs> you should have yeah. seen this guy he had a um, a bottle of wine <laughs> next to him in the pit <laughs> And then Steve invited me out afterwards with the rest of the band and the cast. And he, I think, ordered a pint of vodka. Wow. Yeah. I'm not sure whether they served it, but he drinks. Let's, uh, I mean, I was going to say, to, there's to sum up, to it. A life on the road. Yeah. He is absolutely drinking his way through that show. Wow. Absolutely. He could well be dead now because yeah. it was about 15 years ago. But anyway, <laughs> uh, what you got planned this weekend? What have I got planned? Um, I'm not sure. Cleaning the flat, little boring jobs like that, just because uh, moving out soon. So um, live gotta, admin. Yeah, I've got to get this place yeah. looking tip top and shiny. You, <laughs> bit of work. Yep. Well, yeah. that's been drum and drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, my diary is pretty mental at the moment. Yeah. And so then like, and then I come in texting you every day like I've got another guest. <laughs> Can we have this person on? You like, know chill bin out. Ups. Yeah. <laughs> I've got this phrase, right? You're gonna love it. <laughs> You're trying to do recording <laughs> sessions. I'm just sending you jokes <laughs> that I thought for the podcast. I'm trying to record an average guitarist here. Yeah. And he doesn't understand off beats. This is it. But um yeah. Nice. Well, I uh, hope you enjoyed uh chat with matt yeah chat with matt there you go chat with matt Another big one. up the billups there, there we go. go let's say let's leave it there leave it there instagram twitter email get in touch yeah and we'll see you next time bye thank you for listening to drum and drummer you can find us on instagram at drum and drummer podcast and you can send us an email to drum and drummer pod at gmail.com remember just pick up the sticks and twat it.